Uh, I'd like to uh, present an overview of uh, the Chasmovian in the Appalachian Basin. The uh, Chasmovian interval pretty closely coincides with a formation that I, I've done a good bit of work on called the Glenshaw Formation. It's the lower part of the Cunnemaw group. And in this talk, I'd like to look at the paleogeographic and, and tectonic setting for the Chasmovian, uh, look at sediment dispersal patterns, both during high stands and low stands of sea level, uh, a closer look at the stratigraphic framework and some of the important marker beds, uh, looking also at long-term paleoclimate and, and shorter cycles that may be related to uh, glacial eustacy. Uh, I wanna discuss paleosol bounded cycles that are present uh, both in the marine and non-marine portions of the section, uh, take you through a, a relatively new exposure in southernmost Ohio, uh, where I just recently came across uh, uh, the Portersville Marine Unit, uh, something I've never seen before in the southern part of the basin. And then uh, go over a, a sort of a sequence stratigraphic model that kind of integrates and helps explain how base level dynamics uh, uh, influence the patterns that we see. Next slide, please. Um, this is a fairly familiar paleogeographic reconstruction uh, to all of us. So this is from Blakely. This is from about 300 million years ago, uh, just after the very end of the Chasmovian. And uh, the white arrow points to the location of the uh, Dunkard Basin, which is the northern part of the Appalachian Basin. Uh, and we'll be looking at that a little bit more closely. And of course, during this time, we have uh, ice sheets in Gondwana land expanding and contracting and uh, creating a, a, a variety of uh, eccentricity uh, controlled uh, eustatic sea level changes. Next slide. Just a closer look, uh, the red circle kind of highlights where the Dunkard Basin is located. Again, this is the northern portion of the Appalachian Basin. Uh, we really don't have any upper Pennsylvania sediments uh, south of this in the Appalachian Basin. They've been, they've been eroded off. But again, you can see the tropical location within two or three degrees of the Paleo Equator, and then as you go westward across this slide, you would go from the Dunkard Basin into the Illinois Basin, and then the basins in the Mid-Continent area, uh, which we'll be talking about briefly in. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and here you can see the breakdown of, of the different basins. The Appalachian Basin is a, a foreland basin that uh, is produced by thrust loading uh, with the collision of Gondwana land with the Atlantic margin of Russia. And it's separated from the Illinois Basin by uh, the Cincinnati Arch and Jasmine Dome, which are thought to be related to a four bulge, again, tectonically controlled constraint on the western margin of the basin. And then uh, you have mid-continent uh, basins uh, further to the west. And uh, again, with transgressions of the sea coming and flooding the interior of the continent, uh, they basically come from essentially the southwest in this view and, and uh, expand again, in this particular geography toward, toward the east. So there's kind of basin areas down in uh, the Washita Trough. There are uh, kind of low shelf areas, mid shelf areas, and high shelf areas that uh, using some of Phil Heckel's technology, uh, uh, terminology uh, kind of influence the number of cycle of them and uh, uh, their, their duration. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is uh, just a a quick look, it's a pretty busy diagram, but uh, the red line indicates uh, what is thought to be the hinge line for the Appalachian Basin during the middle, uh, sort of the latest Des Moinesian. And uh, the depot center was uh, located uh, pretty much in where you see the AF and uh, also into Eastern Kentucky, at Southern West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky. And then in the late Pennsylvania, it shifted northward uh, to right about where the uh, end of the red line is uh, toward the northeast. That's the uh, southwestern part of Pennsylvania, and that would be the depot center for the, the Dunkard Basin. And so we have a, a hinge line roughly corresponding to the northwest edge of the Rome Trough, a, a late a neoproterozoic allocogen, and sediments tend to thicken uh, toward the southeast into the, into the uh, more rapidly subsiding uh, Portland Basin. Next slide, please. This is from Don Chesnut's work uh, showing dispersal patterns in the mid to late Pennsylvanian. Uh, the red 
uh, circle highlights the Dunkard Basin, and uh, you can see that uh, there is a, an orogenic source, the Allegheny Orogen, uh, reaching probably peak reliefs here, perhaps 30,000 feet, who knows, uh, but northwest dispersal of immature clastics uh, into the uh, Foreland Basin. Uh, and there are times during high stands of sea level when the sea migrated from the southwest uh, into the basin. Uh, and so we have it during those times, mar uh, marine cord cyclothems and during uh, low stands uh, or, or small or intermediate uh, rises in sea level, the sea gets into the, the mid-continent region and, and, and the Illinois basin, but it doesn't reach the Dunkard basin. And so uh, unless we have a major marine uh, transgression, uh, we don't see the marine influence in the Dunkard basin. We have, we have non-marine cyclothems. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> This is a, a quick look at the stratigraphic framework for the Glenshaw Formation. Uh, the Glenshaw Formation is about 75 meters thick in the southern part of the Dunkard Basin, where I've done most of my work. It uh, reaches 120 meters uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania, where its depot center is located. It extends from the top of the Upper Freeport Coal to the uh, top of the Ames Limestone. And you'll notice here uh, there, there is a lower middle and upper third of the Glenshaw that it kind of is characterized by uh, alternating conditions. The uh, lower third or, or roughly uh, 25 to 28 meters is terrestrial in the southern part of the Dunkard Basin. Uh, the middle part uh, from about 28 to uh, perhaps uh, 50, 55 meters up into the section, uh, there are four marine units that are recognized uh, in the southern part of the basin, uh, and I believe there may be five up and near the depot center, and they're highlighted here in green. <laughs> and then the upper part is largely uh, or, or all terrestrial, uh, in, except for the Ames limestone, which comes in at the very top of the Glenshaw Formation. And then there are a couple of other marine units above the Ames uh, in the Castleman Formation. Uh, I'm going to be working with a traditional Casamovian boundaries here, uh, again, using some of Phil Heckel's work from 2013, uh, where the uh, Casamovian begins below the upper Freeport coal and extends up to uh, about the level of the Harlem coal. Next slide, please. Um, I wanna talk about two climate trends here. Uh, again, these are pretty familiar to, I would say, us, but there is a, an abrupt change in, in the paleoclimate uh, that occurs near the uh, Des Moinesian Missourian boundary. Uh, it is one that is marked uh, by a change in the type of paleosols that we see. Uh, I've noticed in some uh, of the other studies, uh, red beds are not mentioned really below the Brush Creek coal, but uh, the red beds actually begin below the Mahoning horizon, coal horizon, and that's about midway. Uh, midway uh, up into the sort of the middle part of the, uh, well, it's midway between the Brush Creek Coal and the Upper Freeport Coal. So the red beds starting uh, about 15 meters below the Brush Creek Coal. And then they become calcic. We start to see caliche in them uh, when we get near the Mason horizon and, and the Brush Creek, the paleosols that underlie the Mason and Brush Creek Coal horizons. And of course, this is where we see the major lycopod extinction uh, and, uh, this slide is actually the paleoclimate curve is, is from Phillips. The Cunnimaw is often referred to as the barren measures because of the, the lack of general lack of mineable coals, although some of the coals listed here are locally mineable, uh, particularly in the uh, central part of the Dunkard Basin. Uh, Brush Creek uh, coal, Mahoning coal, uh, Bakerstown, even the Harlem are locally mined uh, to the north, but as a rule, they're a lot thinner uh, and, and uh, less extensive than those that we see uh, stratigraphically lower in the section. <laughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a, a, a simplified stratigraphic section showing, for the most part, what are paleosol bounded allocycles uh, in the Glenshaw formation. And I've highlighted the Casimovian portion of it. Uh, you can uh, 
see that the lower part here uh, has uh, between the Brush Creek coal and the upper Freeport coal has three paleosol bounded allocycles. Uh, the middle of the formation, uh, looking at four, five, six, and seven, those are transgressive regressive cycles, only one of which actually has a well developed paleosol. That's the one below the Cambridge limestone. Uh, and these are interbasinal marine units. So, again, you might think, well, maybe these are just local events, but these have been correlated across the mid, all, all the way over to the mid continent. <clears throat> and in the upper part of the section, uh, we have, again, predominantly non marine. Uh, cyclothems, and uh, the top of this would be uh, just above the Pittsburgh red uh, beds, which is a, a very prominent uh, paleosol interval. Next slide, please. The work I've done in the southern part of the Dunker Basin, uh, highlighted with the green uh, numbers five through eight, uh, was implemented to kind of complement uh, work that was done in the 80s and 90s by uh, Bush and Rollins and Bush and West. And they uh, looked at uh, the Glenshaw Formation, again, which closely corresponds to the Chasmovian in Ohio and, and Pennsylvania, where you see numbers one, two, three, and four. And these are stratigraphic columns that they constructed and they recognized what they referred to at the time as climate change surfaces. And essentially these were the boundaries between polygenetic paleosols, uh, paleosols that typically began with uh, uh, indicators of, of, of a seasonally dry climate uh, that uh, then became sort of a rising water table situation, uh, became glade, and in, in many cases uh, directly corresponded to a, a, a marine transgression. Um, you can see that their uh, thicknesses for this uh, range from uh, 58 meters in Athens County at their location four up to as much as 120 meters uh, at their location one, which is near the depot center of the Dunkard Basin. So you can see the influence of more, more, rapid, depth, uh, more rapid subsidence on, on a thickness of the uh, Chasmovian section uh, as you go across from the cratonic margin of the Duncan Basin, Dunkard Basin out into the, to the middle of it. Uh, again, I recognize nine paleosol bounded cycles or transgressive regressive cycles in the southern part of the basin, they've recognized 10. And given the duration of 3.3 million years for the Chasmovian, uh, again, these seem to correspond fairly well to the long eccentricity uh, cycle uh, that would be uh, controlling sea level. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a, just another uh, look, uh, again, from Phil's work. Uh, correlating uh, these marine units uh, and, and coals, which are thought for the most part to be, I, I, got, I know there's varied opinions on this, which I'm sure we'll hear about, but uh, coals are looked at uh, in, in this view as being part of the transgressive phases of these cycles. And so the upper Freeport, Mahoney and Mason coals and the Brush Creek coals are all in that interval in the basin, which uh, to Dunkard, which are predominantly non-marine. Uh, I did read Actually, there is a marine facies above the Mahoning in the middle of the uh, Dunkard Basin. But then in the middle here, you see, uh, again, highlighted with green, uh, that package of uh, marine units, Brush Creek, uh, Upper Brush, Lower Brush, Upper Brush Creek, Cambridge, and Portersville. And uh, that clustering, uh, and then predominantly non-marine above that, and then a clustering of the Ames, Gainport, and Skelly were looked at by previous workers as possible indications of, of basin subsidence uh, that, were, that were tectonically driven. Uh, these third order cycles, as they were referred to by Bush and West, uh, were too long in duration to really correspond to any uh, known uh, glacial eustatic cycles. And so uh, uh, they were attributed to perhaps thrust loading and tectophases of the, of the sort that uh, Frank Ettenson has, has, has spoken of, where we go from thrust loading and deepening of the basin to a relaxation phase uh, where the basin uh, quickly fills. <clears throat> and then we alternate those every few million years. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is just a quick look at the lateral changes. Uh, in cyclothems, uh, they're car carbonate dominated out in the mid-continent, uh, a little bit more clastics in the Illinois 
uh, basin and in the Appalachian cycles uh, where we do have marine influence. Uh, again, the limestones are very thin, discontinuous, uh, and uh, we typically have uh, coarsening upward sequences. There is an overemphasis of the influence of deltas. Uh, they, they are taking place during high stands, uh, but uh, many, I've seen many examples of where previous workers mistook an incised valley fill that cross-cut a, a paleocell bounded allocycle from above and, and cut down into a marine unit below. And, and early workers didn't realize that these were not contemporaneous uh, channels with the marine units that they were, they were found uh, down cut into. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Just another look at uh, some of uh, the correlations between uh, the basinal areas uh, out in Oklahoma, uh, all the way up to the high shelf. And again, in this diagram, I've tried to highlight um, the important uh, markers in the Glenshaw formation. Uh, you'll notice that these, uh, for the most part, represent the major transgressions, the major cycles that uh, Phil Heckel has uh, identified further to the west. <clears throat> and so uh, what we're looking at here is uh, a series of marine units that uh, correspond to the maximum uh, transgression seen earlier on. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just wanna take you quickly through the section here. Uh, not sure exactly how much time I have left here, but um, this is the uh, upper Freeport coal and a uh, vertic uh, glade paleosol beneath it. Uh, above it, you see flood, plate, flood basin deposits. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the lowest red bed interval, uh, about 15 meters above the upper Freeport. It is about also 15 meters below the Brush Creek coal. It is a uh, red uh, vertisol, but not uh, does not have caliche. Next one. This is the uh, Mason possible Mason horizon, uh, and also the Brush Creek coal horizons, about five meters apart here in this new section uh, along Ohio 52 near Ashland. Next slide. And these are the, uh, again, marine units in that middle part of the Glenshaw, the lower Brush Creek, the upper Brush Creek, again, shown in the left there, the Cambridge, and then just recently discovered the Porterville. And in the lower left, you can see the top of the uh, lower Brush Creek Marine Zone. This is a really great example of uh, tidally influenced uh, mouth bar deposition. Uh, this is a tidal bundle. It has about 25 or 26, uh, units, and again, the red zone there highlights that, uh, lower part of the red zone highlights it. There's a marine ravinement bed right on top of that, and then the darker shale is the upper Brush Creek Marine Zone. Next slide, please. Here you see the Cambridge and Portersville limestones at that same outcrop. Again, well-developed paleosol below the Cambridge. Portersville, uh, not a paleosol, but uh, a transgressive limestone, a lot of rip-ups in it. Next slide, please. This uh, cut from northeastern Kentucky uh, shows the incised valley fill of the Salzburg sandstone member below the Pittsburgh Reds. Uh, this IBF is one of the biggest in the Glenshaw. It is, reaches a thickness of about 35 meters. Here it only down cuts to a little bit above the upper Brush Creek, but close, closer by it actually goes through the Brush Creek Colt where it's 35 meters thick. Next one. <clears throat> closer look at the uh, Pittsburgh Red bed paleosol and the flood basin deposits on top of it. This is a good example of an interfluvial sequence boundary, which is what I have interpreted the tops of these paleosols. And then flood basin deposits on top and then the splay sands there have some interesting tracks. Next slide. This is a trackway from Arthropleura um, showing the uh, Diplocanites cuicthensis type trace, very large. Um, I think this is about a, a, a 30 centimeters wide. And then you can see some tetrapod footprints, probably areopoid amphibians, pretty much on the same bedding plane, just to the left of this. Next slide. There are marine, non-marine uh, correlations that have been established between the marine core cyclothems of the Huntington area and those of the Charleston area. The maximum transgression of the marine units uh, is shown uh, and that the Charleston to uh, Flatwoods locations are uh, within about 10 to 15 kilometers of these marine units. And so these cycles of rising and falling sea level probably influenced the non-marine section being as close as they were. Next slide. Ron, 
I'm, yes. I'm sorry to jump in. Your time is up. Do you think you can finish in two minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, Please do. Okay. Blue over here is the package uh, in the Huntington area of the four Marine units. Over here is the uh, blue interval uh, with uh, paleosols that have uh, micro uh, spiroborid microconchids, which uh, are believed to indicate marine influence. And so there is a, a close similarity between the thickness and internal structure of the marine cord cyclothems and the non-marine cyclothems of the uh, Charleston area. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. One more, next slide. These are the non-marine cyclothems in the Charleston area. This is the two mile limestone overlaying a very thick paleosol, uh, coarsening upward sequence, another thick paleosol above this, again with microconchid uh, spororbids. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the model for this includes episodes where during glacial eustatic low stands, there is uh, you have falling stage and low stand and early stage, stage systems tracks, which involve downcutting of these valleys and interfluvial paleosol development. And during the latter part of transgressive systems tracks, these valleys fill. You have a, a late TST with uh, maximum flooding surface right above the limestones, whether they're marine or the microconchid type, and then coarsening upward sequences during the high stands. And these seem to correspond to episodes with arid, semi-arid climatic settings during the low stands and wetter uh, conditions related to rising base level and high stance. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, I can try and discuss other aspects of this uh, later in the discussion section or for questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Ron. Um, let's see, we already have, John Isbell has a question. John, can you turn on your audio and video, please? Sure, hi, Ron. Uh, hi, John. You had mentioned early in the talk that the Appalachians reached uh, maybe as much as 30,000 feet. Uh, I know there's evidence for ice rafted material in the late Devonian uh, with the Robinson Stone. Is there any evidence for glaciation in the Appalachians uh, during the, the Pennsylvanian, and especially the late Pennsylvanian? In, in what are today the Appalachians? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. And I, I mentioned the 30,000 feet uh, just in passing because uh, you know, we look at continental collisions today in the Himalayas and um, the African part of Gondwana land, I would, would think would certainly have the same potential to create that sort of relief. So I'm, uh, that's pretty speculative. Yeah, with that kind of relief, you would expect some type of alpine glaciation. Yeah, true. And stuff. So interesting, thank you. Okay, and... Uh... Bill DeMichael has a question. Bill, can you turn on your audio video, please? Hi, Ron. Um, Hi. Uh, not to, I, I don't want to be contrary. I think you and I, with regard to coal, might be closer than we think. Um, um, since it's, I remember uh, you know, the famous old line that um, um, you may not be able to tell, there may be a continuous line from the valley to the mountain, but I will define, defy you to tell me there's no valley and no mountain. And I think with the, with the curves that you see with regard to high stand, low stand, transgressive track, I probably could agree that coal is in the later parts of low stand and, and on the transgressive systems track. So I, I think that that's when it gets wet because coal, coal needs rainfall. There, I don't think there are any modern environments where you can show rising sea level causing the kind of peat deposit that would turn into a Pennsylvania coal with low ash and, and all that. Um, so I, just to say, I, I, I think that the that we're closer than, than you might think. Yeah, you and I have had this discussion, I think, several years back when we were doing the, when I was working on the Walshia paper. And I can see where you could maybe move the coal into maybe the early, early trans transgressive systems track. It's just that if, if these paleosols are on the inner flues, then you've got to fill the valleys before you can start capping these inner flues with coal or, or lacustrian deposits. And so, you know, during the low stand and even the earliest part of the trans transgressive systems track, the interfluvial areas basically don't have any accommodation space. And so I would, I would view those as continuing to undergo pedogenesis 
until base level had risen and, and you infilled uh, the, the drainage lines, the paleo valleys. Yeah. Exactly. Now, if the if the coal if the paleosols are not actually in the upland areas, then that's different, and and, and maybe there's an argument to be made there. Uh, in the in the way that I have tried to understand this, I, I look at the well developed paleosols as developing on the inner flues uh, while the uh, well during falling sea level and low stand and early transgressive systems track because it's an area of negative accommodation. One of the interesting things John Isbell raised an interesting question that I, and I can't remember the coal, but there is a coal in the Appalachians where there were what looked like drop stones, boulders in the coal bed. It was published back, I believe in the thirties. I've seen pictures of a shelf with these boulders on it. And I've probed at the West Virginia survey to see if they still have the samples. Do you know about that? I forget the coal bed, but that would go along with nearby glaciers during coal formation. I, I don't think I remember that one. I remember Gestaldo uh, had some granite cobbles and boulders, but I think he he related that to basically erosion of, of trees and the roots had wrapped themselves around the bedrock and carried it out into the basin. So I don't think that was interpreted as, as a drop stone from glaciers. Uh, but I, I don't recall the one that, that you're referring to. And I have to admit, I've been away from research for the last four years. So I, I, forgive me if I'm a little out of touch. <laughs> I say, yeah, this is an old paper. And man, I understand being out of touch. Administration is death. <laughs> By the way, I, just, I have just stepped down as, as chair. So I hope to get back into this with some uh, earnest. <laughs> yeah, Bill, uh, there are reports in the Illinois Basin and limestones uh, of pebbles as well. Uh, they're, they're really old, and I believe in Kansas as well. But uh, they're from back in the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, and, and in Ohio that I, I've seen, but I haven't seen anything recent. Yeah, I think they're all old papers. Interesting. Thanks. And these drop stones are in the marine units or in the coal beds? No, there's one that is reported from a coal bed in the, in the Appalachian Basin. It's really puzzling. What are they doing there? How do they get there? Things just don't float into coal swamps because they're all full of vegetation, unless they're periodically flooded and we don't see the horizons. Yeah. Hey, Bill, this is Cortland. Are you by any chance confusing that with the drop stone in the top of the Devonian shale? No, that's another one, Cortland. Yeah, I've got okay, a picture okay. of you standing on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the big one. But these are little guys. They're, okay. They're so big. Well, uh, one thing I'll tell you, and, and this is, might not be relevant, but in the Cretaceous of Kansas, there are stones lying around in, in, in chalk. And those are thought to have been brought in by reptiles. Who, who spit them up. So maybe some big amphibian coughed up a rock in a, in a coal swamp. I'm just, I mean, that you have to consider that. That's it's an outside possibility. 